This is Startup Storefront. Want to spice up your morning latte? Try adding some mushrooms to it. And not just any mushrooms, but a specific species that only grows on a small percentage of birch trees in cold weather climates. Seems a bit extreme, right? To Brandon Mizrahi, it seemed like the perfect idea for a business. Chaga mushrooms are known to have a long list of health benefits, so Brandon set out to find the perfect delivery system. After offering several varieties of chaga beverages at a local farmer's market, the one that was far and away the best seller was the chaga chino. But success at one farmer's market can only get you so far, and Brandon knew that this product had much bigger potential. So listen in as we cover everything from why he didn't want his branding to be associated with hippies, why humans are closer to the fungi kingdom than the plant kingdom, and why adaptogens are more of a rediscovery than a new trend. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Brandon with Renewed. Thanks for coming on. People don't know. What does your company do? We sell mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Shroom salads. Nice. Uh, Let's but yeah, go. But it's, it's actually a mushroom coffee, and it's the non-psychedelic mushroom, which it's funny because that's really polarizing because some people are like, oh, thank God, and some people are like, oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's so true. Uh, I'm a bit of a hybrid in that, yeah. But yeah. The, the fungi in the mushroom kingdom is interesting. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about it a little bit. It's an interesting kingdom. You know, there's the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom that we're in, and then there's the fungi kingdom, and it's it's there's 2.6 million to 3.3 million species in it, and chaga, the chaga mushroom, is considered the king of the fungi kingdom. They also call it the diamond of the forest. It has to be wild forage like uh, truffles. And the reason they call it the diamond of the forest is because it's made under pressure in, in, in nature. And like a diamond. Like a diamond, yeah. Okay, so why is it considered the king? Because out of that kingdom, it has so many health benefits. We just say live long, die pretty. Because it's everything from the highest amount of antioxidants on the planet. And that's compared to acai, pomegranates, blueberries. It's like three pounds worth of blueberries in one gram of chaga, which is in every drink wow. that we make pretty much. Yeah. So for your immune system, um, it's an immunomodulator, meaning it can work with your immune system. I don't want to get too sciencey here, but... What made you want to start the company? And like what, what year? So adaptogens hit the market not too long ago. How were you super early? Did you sound like a crazy person for a while? Yes. The word didn't even exist in like kind of the cultural zeitgeist at the time and we started using it around our product and i had not seen other brands using the word adaptogens really okay. um in mass what year was that that was 2017 okay but product development around 2016 i would say okay but i mean actually launching and stuff yeah and you were always consuming these personally yes adaptogens and tropics the whole bit all of it and okay. were you making I, it yourself i was yeah. i was making it the old-fashioned way so it grows on birch trees and only in freezing climates only on birch trees and only one in ten thousand birch trees so you literally like truffles like they bring pigs out in the forest the wild foragers out there in alaska siberia chiang Mai mountains it grows in in upstate new york and british columbia and northern climates that have birch wild birch forests it'll grow on the tree basically where it gets struck by lightning or wounded attacked by insects as sort of like a band-aid to protect the tree from infection so kind of without it the tree would die from infection like a wound like an open wound and in exchange for that protecting the tree it kind of makes this nature handshake deal where it says all right i'm going to protect you mr birch tree but now i'm going to start taking some of your amazing nutrients and this is one of the healthier trees on the planet they live hundreds of years loaded with nutrients and you're not able to get the nutrients out of this tree from this forest because what are you going to do? Like chop it down and, and start eating a, a huge a tree, or, tree or, yeah. or, or boiling it in a pot, like try and steeping it like a tea. So what the chaga does is it pre-digests the nutrients at about an inch per year, growing at about one to two inches per year until after 10 years to 15 years, it's the size of maybe like a beehive. And by that time, it's the most nutrient dense superfood, adaptogen, fungi, whatever we want to call it, on the planet by far. Wow. You know, 1,600 research papers on this thing, everything from, you know, we don't make disease claims because we're not allowed to as a product, but all the research is there. And Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, all the top sites have, you know, PubMed have research on it. I mean, you know, like I said, we just try and say live long, die pretty and keep it, and keep it simple, stupid, kiss, because 
it's so hard to communicate all this, but the reason, the reason why it's so special is that, and there's other adaptogens and superfoods and they're all great. I'm not knocking the others. Cause like you said, I, I've experimented with all of them as far as I'm, whenever I hear about one, I try it. I like to experiment on myself. You know, Sheila Jeet's really interesting. There's some other really great stuff. Every indigenous culture has an adaptogen. I think it's like maca in Peru, ashwagandha in parts of India and you know, rhodiola, there's, there, there's a list of about 12 to 15 adaptogens that are kind of like the elite superfoods. So when you were first thinking about starting a business, so you're consuming them, you're a believer, and then it's a function of how do I introduce this to the humans out there? hundred percent. So, and so like, right. So there must've been 30 paths that you're thinking about. Yeah. Maybe I go this route, this route, this route. Ultimately you land, you land on coffee. I think that makes sense. But what, what did you think about on your journey of like, how do I make this appeal to the masses? Yeah. So I went into it. My background is in tech. So I, I was building data centers and hosting websites and, and bringing these mom and pop shops online so they could sell. And that was pretty much out of school when I graduated from UCLA in 2004. So I did that for like 15 years. Yeah. And wow. that was my back. I had no background in CPG, in health and wellness, in any of these spaces. So originally I'm thinking, all right, let's bottle this. There's no chaga beverages on the market. I've seen coconut waters and at that time, it, you know, that was hot and kombuchas obviously and cold brew and all these uh, drinks, but functional beverages weren't that, I mean, those are functional beverages. It's so is Gatorade really, but, but the term didn't really exist and adaptogens and, and beverages didn't really exist. So I'm like, you know, just thinking about it as a tea in that way, because that was the category chaga tea. And so I talked to a couple of my buddies and they're all telling me, don't, don't do this. Your background's in tech. If you want to, you know, if you want to start a company, like start build an app, do this, you know, and, and, and which isn't bad advice. It's not like, bad advice. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that's your craft. You're kind of the product expert. That's your some extent. You have yeah. a black belt in that. That's your craft. And now you're going to go <laughs> back and start over with like no training in this new, like, right. you know, kind of like using that analogy as like a, as like a novice in, in, in this fight or battle or, I mean, not that we need to look at entrepreneurship as a fight or battle, but I it guess I did say black belt. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I had to keep, I like gotta keep the metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so I just followed my gut really. And my instincts and I said, and I agreed with their advice too, but also disagreed with it a part of me. And, and that was my gut. And so, yeah, I was going to originally do it as an RTD as a ready to drink beverage, yeah. you know, and uh, bottled. So I went to a flavor house. My buddy's like, you don't have to do all the formulation and the design. You can go to these flavor houses and they, they'll make flavors for you and you can just launch it that way. So that's what I did. And then, you know, again, just following my gut, when I went in there, there was people in lab coats and they're like, yeah, these are their flavors. You can make a cherry chaga. You can make a lemon. You can do it. And I go, okay, well, can I get back there? Because I was already messing around tinkering with formulation at, at my house. I was brewing my own kombuchas, you know, growing my own stevias. And, and that was sort of my health and wellness journey. Personally, I was just tinkering and experimenting because I had some health issues growing up and pharma just didn't seem to work. What, with what were the health issues? I, from a young age, I was having really bad stomach issues. Uh, I remember being in like third grade, like in fetal position and so much pain. And, you know, my parents took me to see every doctor, obviously, and I was getting strep throat and sick all the time. And I was big into sports, missing all the basketball games and yeah. big games. It was just like terrible. Was so, this immune system or dietary? Yeah. So we didn't know. We went to see all they these specialists. They just IBS or something. Yeah. They ended up calling it IBS and, and they were, they were looking for disease and there wasn't any tumors or disease in there. So, and you know, they're putting tubes down me and I have to drink this blue thing the night before. And it's just awful at that age to deal with that. And I just remember the doctors like looking for the disease and they, they never, they, they didn't have a holistic approach back then where they asked me what I was, they never asked me what I was eating. Not once. Yeah. And, and what that was I eating? That never be the issue. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, I have stomach issues. Yeah. Hey, let's not ask him what he's eating. Yeah. <laughs> so, you right. know, also, IBS no... is like an ocean of, oh yeah, you have that. It's, like, it right. can it's be like anything. anything. It's a catch-all. <laughs> it could be anything. It's a catch-all. Yeah. And the funny thing is, what was I eating? I was, and I, and look, I love my parents. My mom is the greatest, but at that time it was, I had to say that, right? And it's true. I, yeah, I still yeah. feel like I have the umbilical cord sure. attached. I'm yeah, a mama's yeah, yeah, boy yeah. for sure. But at that time they just didn't know as much. I mean, look, it was Ronald McDonald, happy meals growing up in the eighties. It was the playground was there at McDonald's, right? Yeah. you know, it was these lunchables and these, these processed meals. Oh, yeah. And it was, oh, yeah. 
and it was, you know, the Kool-Aid guy jumping through the wall and it was Toucan Sam and Tony <laughs> the Tiger on the cereals. And, you know, it was like all these cartoons and stuff market and all marketed towards little children. And they didn't know back then, I don't think they didn't have an awareness and look at the ingredient panels like we study them now and look at the list of things and, you know, all these different diets that exist now, ketogenic and low carb and you know, uh, all these things, gluten-free determined didn't exist back then. Right. And all these things. And anyways, I was just extra sensitive to the food system. And what I'd noticed growing up was a lot of people seem to have those same issues that I had. I just experienced them at a much younger age, way more severely. It was just a sensitivity that I have. And I think in entrepreneurship, like it's kind of interesting, like how that leads opens a door because sometimes you can lead that sensitivity can lead to a superpower, you know, or that, you know, it's like, the, I guess, the lemon to the lemonade or like, you know, turn darkness into dark chocolate. Like it's, you, you can turn that, that bad or like tragic thing that happened to you into something that's amazing. We hear that a lot. Like Brooke from Good Milk. Mm -hmm. Oh know. yeah. Yeah. So we Brooke had IBS, same thing. Mm -hmm. And then she was just such a, she couldn't do dairy or didn't want to do dairy, but really wanted to create a product with no gums or binders. So that led her down the almond milk journey. Uh, we had Kerrigan on who had PCOS and yeah. same thing. And she just became like a chemist for her own body. And now she has a product that helps a tremendous amount of people. I mean, like thousands and thousands of people. And it's just her solving her own problem and then turning that into a product market. That's exactly what happened to me. I wasn't thinking about, I was just like, this has helped me so much. Like at the time too, I was, I was tinkering with my well, as a child with my mom in the kitchen and trying every diet blood type diet uh we we did vegan we did we were brewing our own kombucha before dave's gt was out there because we knew pro about probiotics you know we were doing we were growing our own stevia at the time because we wanted to cut the sugar and it was illegal in the u.s till 94 it was legal wow. in japan yeah I don't really have an Jeez. answer for why of the sugar either. industry probably. Yeah. yeah, I could yeah the lobby. Probably, yeah. The, interest, yeah. the big lobbies. A hundred percent. So, you know, because once you start doing R and D in the kitchen, you start thinking about a company and so they just kill that. Yeah. At the, at the, at the doorstep basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I was doing, we were doing that and just always tinkering with different recipes and, and trying to heal myself. That was, that was really how eventually I discovered this product. And then growing up, I got into, you know, different adaptogens. And I was actually, I, I, I had a girlfriend whose parents were making these, these tinctures. Um, like they were, they were living off the grid. They had this, this company where they would rehab like injured wild animals, like super hippies that moved off the grid, living near the Black Rock desert where, where the burning man is. And, yeah, yeah. and so I went over there and they had this, like, they built this like house in, in the, in the, in, in the hillside. It looks like I'm in like, Frodo Baggins, his house in, in the Hobbit or <laughs> Shire. something, the Shire, <laughs> yeah. whereas Gandalf, you know, like, and then, and then they had this, like, like there was like llamas on the property and eagles. And they were, they would basically rehab these animals and then release them into nature. And then they had this other magical place where there was our other office where they were taking all of these plants and, and extracting them into tinctures. So I, st so they started giving me this one and that one. And they, I told them about some of my issues and the, so next thing I know, I'm taking a couple of drops of nettle root and St. John's wort and, and all these names I'd never heard before. Cat's claw. What is this stuff? You know, and they showed me how they were making it and kind of gave me the, the tutorial on it. And that kind of like got my interest into alternative yeah. ways of doing it because it really had That's helped fascinating. me. fascinating. And then I just kept kept doing that and, and, and discovered chaga. And this stuff had helped me more than anything. I mean, cured my asthma. Um, got rid of like skin issues, like some acne that I was having. I was like getting a ton of grays and then, and then my, my hair is, is, you know, got more like jet black, the color, cause it has the highest melanin out of anything on the planet too, which is amazing for your skin, psoriasis, your hair color, all those things. And for your pineal gland, which is like in between the left and right hemisphere of your brain, what people call it like your third eye sometimes. And there's some woo woo stuff, but, but I like to stay away from that part of it. We, we, we specifically didn't go in a branding direction of like tie dye, uh, tie dye <laughs> yeah. and yeah, like yeah. what's your horoscope uh, uh, type thing. Even though like, look, I'm not knocking that. I'm super into all things spiritual. But we just wanted to go in a more fun route in terms of the branding. I want to ask you like a business question. So when you were going down this, this like journey, both personal, but also there's a product here at some point, 
Did you look at the business side of like adaptogens and were you starting to understand there's something here, this is going to become the next thing? So we today, we get like pitch decks around all these companies starting their adaptogen mix, whatever they're doing, right? And they're launching all in like similar but very different ways. So I got a couple of these decks and I'm like, I don't understand any of this. I don't understand the market. Is it big? Is it not? So I know nothing. So then I I just started doing my own research. And in doing my own research, what I learned was You have the CBD market and a lot of people think this market, well, we know it's booming. So that we take, okay, check, it's booming, cool. A lot of people that feel like the CBD market, let's call it my mom, it's taboo. It's still, they don't want it. They don't want to be a part of it. There's like a very similar trajectory where the adaptogen market is not riding that wave. It's almost like if I understand the benefits of CBD, but I still feel weird about, let's call it going to church, I'll just go here. I'll take a little left to my adaptogen world where I'm okay and I like this party better. And so these two markets are like following each other. Is that how, is that, is that it? Pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's like part of the set, you know, of the waves. Uh, They're they're very correlated. And I feel like it's not that you can't have one without the other. Cause like, I do think if CBD did fizzle out, which I don't think will happen, I think the adaptogens are, are here to stay. I mean, these type of things predate religion. I mean, these adaptogens, I mean, we're talking about Utsi, the ice man was discovered, like the oldest preserved caveman in the Italian Swiss Alp border. There's a museum for him over there. And they found birch polypores and chaga around his neck as a necklace. And that, and that dude lived to like 60 years old. Um, and he didn't even die from natural causes. It was like a rival arrow wound. So like, you know, and this is in like 2000 BC, you know, before Christ. So we're talking about like, I don't even know how many thousands of years ago, like, you know, four to 5,000 years ago where our ancestors were using these things. So it's almost like a rediscovery more than like this new trend. I think it is a, I I don't, I wouldn't call it adaptogens, um, a trend. It's definitely a wave right now, but I think it's, I think it's a movement more than a trend. You know, it's, I think it's here to stay in the same way kombucha came and yeah. then, and it's here to stay and the same way almond milk came and it's here to stay and the same way coconut water came and it's here to stay. Okay. I think it's a whole new category. Yeah. Functional beverages. And, and look, they existed before, like we were talking before about earlier. This, yeah. yeah. Like, and, and like Gatorade and electrolytes and, and, and protein drinks and all of these things. So maca, like the Incans, that was a thing, you know? And then totally. it's like, all of a sudden people are doing it now and again. Yeah. And I yeah. Was like, That's so fascinating. Cause it was like the thing. Yeah, yeah it's more of a rediscovery, it. I think. And I, and I think the reason it's happening now so much is because people are really, like like myself, had bad experiences with pharma and Western medicine. And I'm not just here to sit here and knock Western medicine. Look, right. man, yeah. the greatest invention of all time <laughs> is surgery with anesthesia. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. like can you imagine like Civil in the Wild War West? Battlefield like, sawing off your leg. Yeah, or just like taking yeah. the bullet out yeah. with the whiskey and the cowboy. Yeah. Like, so look, Western medicine is incredible. <laughs> and God bless the doctors and all of the doctors out there. But look, we know that there's been a lot of lobbying in pharma and a lot of a lot of scary stuff, especially in the US. And a lot of people have had side effects and had a lot of problems from that industry. So I think, I think it kind of people are looking for a natural way to heal themselves. um, And a more holistic approach is my experience and what I was looking for. And you know, to go back to your first question, you know, when I was in those flavor houses, it was just, you know, maybe it was the, the kind of instincts that I was getting from the Chaga or the sort of internal compass. But when I see this person in a lab coat and he's like, yeah, we're just going to add this natural flavor and that natural flavor to it. It sounds pretty good. Natural. It's natural. It's a flavor. Cool. Like, but then when you realize that's what Coca-Cola says on their label, you know, and that's what all these terrible products in natural flavor. So, so when I started asking too many questions, so I'm asking the, the, the person in the coat, you know, the lab coat, like, Hey, what's in this this strawberry natural flavor. Right. They're like, uh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll (laughs) supply it to you. And, you know, smell it. No, they they were kind of dodging the question. So yeah. then I kept grilling them on it. So I'm like, okay, but what happens if I want to get this flavor from somebody else? What happens if you guys run out? What happens, you know, and what happens That's if my, question. what happens if my customers are vegan and they want to ask what's in it and, or, or this or that, they couldn't answer. They're just like, you just say strawberry natural flavor or lemon natural flavor. And I go, where does it come from? And they we would not answer that question. So then I'm, I go, All right. Then then I thought about it and my gut was telling me, all right, this is maybe the quick way to launch the drink, but it's not the right way to launch the drink. So I went in a different route. The way that we landed actually in coffee was 
um, I was making it as a tea. So I would get the chaga chunks, grind them up like a, like, like coffee. Yeah, how um, do you source it? So, so like, how do you buy it? Yeah. So I'm, I'm buying it from wild forages the same way they okay. buy truffles. I like, was going to ask yeah. you how, how sustainable is it if you have to forage for it? Yeah. Great, great question. That was my number one thing that I actually did research on this, yeah. that and the health benefits and the efficacy of it. Cause I'm like, all right, if I'm going to put in all this time on this thing, like, this better be, you know, scalable. scalable and it also better have better have the efficacy and the in the research papers on it and not like I'm not selling people take this pill and you'll lose weight or take this pill and you're going to grow your hair. I wanted it to be re- real and not just be anecdotal too, you know. So in terms of sustainably harvesting the chaga, they leave 20 to 25% of it on the tree so it can be re- could regrow and be reharvested. They actually GPS the trees or our wild foragers. So they can easy. find it <laughs> yeah. so they yeah, can, yeah. so they know where it is. In these yeah. crazy one in 10,000 birch trees. Exactly. That's smart. So that's, that's pretty much considered sustainably harvesting the chaga. You said that it takes uh, several years to grow to full size. So it's like they GPS it and then like, you know, five years later they come back and reharvest. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And is it one of these things where if I have the whole thing, let's say I have the whole thing, whatever yeah. it looks like, how big is that mushroom? It, it's about this. It, it, I, it's about the size of a beehive, like a large okay. beehive. Imagine okay. I yeah. take that. And I don't know. I, I just I just cut it in half. Nick has one half. I have the other. Are we? <laughs> is, it one of these, is it one of these things where you're just gonna magically feel everything, or does it not work that way? Yeah. So it needs or is to it be like doses. You have to really do. You have to steep it. Smaller. It needs to be extracted. Okay. So, right. so you okay. can steep it. Okay. Um, which is the way that the that you know they would do it over a campfire. The, the way that the indigenous asked, people would do it. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you could eat it, but it, it it's more like a you tree vomit. bark or a wood. If people want to Google like chaga on the tree oh, they'll, they'll really? see it. it looks like a, it you would never in a million years think that this was in the fungi kingdom it looks like a piece of tree bark got it okay, you know? okay. and so um, you steep it you steep it so there's a process a little bit of a process here. yeah okay. and, there, and there's more modern extraction techniques but but also with our company we wanted to keep it solvent free because a lot of times when they extract from any plants or, or even cbd or whatever it may be or your vitamins in your cabinet. It, you can extract using solvents, meaning alcohol, ethanol, and that's where you get the fat soluble compounds out of it because water will just extract the water soluble compounds. Um, so, you, so a lot of brands will introduce, or a lot of extraction companies will use fat soluble compounds like alcohol, ethanol, um, acetate, which is nail polish remover. So really like harsh chemicals um, and harsh things. And, and those aren't on the ingredient label, but it does kind of change the taste and and quality of your item and then to get it from a liquid to a powder like in your vitamins or any powdered beverage whether that's like an athletic greens or you know liquid iv or any anything that's in powder format or drop in mix format it can either be freeze dried or spray dried and when you spray dry something it's with a chemical and when you freeze dry it it's just you're literally just freezing it and then it's getting into from a liquid to a powder uh, so we we're using a solvent free extraction method, actually using pressure, high pressure to extract the fat soluble compounds, meaning like 5000 PSI, like a trip to a traditional like pressure cooker will use like 15 PSI. So it's almost it's, it's like a dangerous. What does it look amount. like? It, it, it's in it's in like a, a special like factory type of environment. And it looks like an industrial type of uh, big. You know, like is, is there like something that you can equate that to? Is that like travel? If you were to travel to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, like is that five thousand psi down there? That's or? a good point. Yeah, that, it, it, that's that's a great question. Pro- it is. Yeah, probably okay. like that's where you experience. I mean, I don't know five thousand psi, but yeah. you know, I know as you go up or go down, <laughs> the pressure goes up exponentially. So it's similar to that, where it's just like technology is now keeping that sort of. You can look at it like it's keeping that particle and in, intact in, in of the pressure and then they can extract it without it kind of exploding that's kind of a trick we use to get the to do a solvent free extraction to get the water soluble and the fat soluble compounds the triterpenes and the polysaccharides and all these scientific words like like in cbd they talk a lot about those words too and yeah and then and then it gets freeze dried you were initially drinking it from in a tea form. Correct. And correct. so your product is exclusively for coffee. So how did you make that shift and why, most importantly? Yeah, so I, was, I would have been happy to get this out to people 
in any format because it, like I said, it helped me so much. And it, literally the reason I'm starting this company is to help other people like it helped me. That was, that was pretty much what it was. And I'm not saying that there wasn't like a, uh, it's a, this is a nonprofit or I'm not trying to make money. I, I trying to do both. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm not one of these people that doesn't believe in capitalism. I'm very capitalism. And I believe that you can pair capitalism and 100%. having a good product that helps people, yeah. you know, upgrading products, whether that's like what impossible burger has done, sir Kensington has done it for ketchup or like a million other brands, you know, um, you know, we can sit there with PETA and be, protesting and putting blood on ourselves and, and, or you can start impossible burger. So I think they're just different ways to the waterfall on it. And so I was making it like a T and then I would be happy to relaunch it to anybody in that format, you know, and I liked how it tastes like that. I was also adding some well, like uh, organic pr fresh pressed lemons and some uh, monk fruit to it and making this like oh, chaga so lemonade, yeah. like chaga palmer, I think we were calling that one. That nice. <laughs> and then I was doing this like rice, rice milk with, a lot of cacao and cinnamon and doing this sort of like the horchata horchaga yeah, we were, yeah, yeah. like kind of recipe kind of like decadent but uh and then i was doing it as a latte i was experimenting with different flavors i got curious you know after making it the the old-fashioned way and i was sampling it for my friends and family every time they came over check out this new drink i'm making and they they were just i couldn't hang on to any of it myself so i said you know what let me let me get this out there we got all these amazing farmers markets out here. I don't need to hire like a, a research company and pay them to do this market research. I'll just go out to Melrose Place, figure out, I'll buy a tent and and get a license and, sure. you know, figure this out. So I went, I went there, I got one of the square card readers, set up the tent, put the flavors there. Every week after week I'm seeing, and we were kegging it at the time too. So, you know, it was on draft and... So we're serving the plain chaga chi, the, the, the chaga palmer, the horchaga, and the chaga chino, right? Which is this creamy latte of, of a mushroom mocha kind of flavor profile. And just week after week, that was what people voted for when they, when they ordered. Yeah, and it was like five to one, seven to one, ten to one chaga chino versus the other drink. So I'm like, all right, if this is the delivery system people want this chaga in, I'll meet them where they're at. I'm not going to decide for them. They've clearly voted. We did this for three months. And did you have to explain it to them or, or would you say the people we, that were coming up were like, they understood? A lot of them hadn't heard of Chaga. Sure. I mean, yeah. we had like information sure. stuff. and it was the same amount in each drink, but like in, from, in terms of the education, yeah. we had a lot of educational like literature there and, and stuff that so we So they like the taste. They, they love the taste. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, whatever it is. I like it. I like that. Taste. Pretty much. Some people, <laughs> so, some people are more interested in the health benefits. Some people don't even care. They're just like, this tastes better than my normal coffee. I'm going to have this. And some people care about both. So, you know, they voted for this one. And then I was thinking like, you know, at the time, I kind of ran into these issues with the, with the RTD, with, with bottling it, you know, because of those flavor houses and, you know, dealing with that. So I was like, you know what, like, let me meet people where they're at. They want this version of the drink in, as a latte and as sort of like a mocha frappuccino flavor profile. I'll meet, and then I, I did some research. I'm like, that is actually the number one selling coffee on the planet, the mocha frappuccino. Starbucks obviously sells that and the RTDs as well and like all the right. gas stations and, and places, uh, markets around the country. So look, those are America's taste buds. That's what they like. We're going to do that clean, healthy version of that drink. So instead of like processed cocoa, we're using raw cacao from Peru. Yeah. Instead of crappy, you know, cinnamon, we're using Ceylon cinnamon from Sri Lanka. We're using the chaga mushroom. We're using Madagascar vanilla, real vanilla, no binders, fillers, emulsifiers, no solvents, just clean, clean, clean. And that translates to the taste. You don't get that weird funky aftertaste when, when you drink our monk fruit. You know, it took me six months just to find the monk fruit supplier for this drink um, at all these trade shows and supplier conferences. So then we said, all right, let's meet people where they're at. They want it in a coffee delivery system. Where do they get coffee from the coffee shops? So we approached the trendiest coffee shop in L.A. at the time and maybe still is Alfred Coffee, um, Melrose Place, which is where we were doing the farmer's markets. And it took about three months of talking to their managers and their owners and their product development team. And, and then they put it on the menu and then it was quickly one of the most popular drinks on the menu. I was going to say, that, it must've sounded so crazy to them. And even, and even like to some extent to you, right? And so here you are on this journey and not to say it's like a left, but it's very tangential. And also margins wise, is it easier? Is it not easier? Because at some point you're also, you're reliant, right? So so kind of like that symbiotic relationship between the chaga and the tree, you know, you, there has to be 
they have to be willing to absorb you, sell you in order for you to win. That's seemingly a huge hurdle. So, so Alfred, you do a three month run. It's crushing. Cool. Does it always take, is like the sales time three months for a coffee shop to finally go, all right, yeah, let's try it. Or is it, is it easier? Yeah. You know, so with, it, the scalability of oh just man. the, like the pitch is. Well, at that time too, they were like, we want to do it. I mean, there, there's been so many hurdles and challenges because at that time too, they go, okay, after three months of convincing them, they go, okay, well, we're going to do it on draft in a keg. And then, so now I got to mm. find a co-packer to do it for <laughs> one coffee shop. And, and actually they have like a few locations too. So that's like the logistics of that. You know, I'm already doing this myself at the farmer's markets, but I got to deliver this to Alfred Beverly Hills, Alfred Studio City, Alfred, right. you know, here and right. there. So I got to go and find a co-packer to make this stuff every week for me. And everyone said, no, yeah. who, who wants to make like a few yeah. kegs for you? And kegs the are pretty, not there. Yeah. Yeah. So I finally find this one, um, co-packer all the way out in like Camarillo, like an hour and a half away. And, you know, I pitched them like, like a, like an investor almost, you know, or, or and get them excited about the future. And yeah, we're going to scale this thing, take a chance on us. And we kind of became friends with the owner and, um, they took a chance on us and they did it for us and they co-packed it. And then I would, we would be taking kegs and now we got to get a refrigerated van to transport it from Camarillo to these locations. And it's a latte using, and it's a latte using at that time. It was, like an oat it, milk it, it, but at that time that even pre predated like, the nut milk. Okay. yeah. So it, it was a blend of cashew and almond milk that we were using at that time in there. And after like a week, we started noticing that it was fermenting and starting to taste sour and turning into like a yogurt. <laughs> so now we're like, all right, we got to do a kill step on these, on, the, on this with the co-packer. So now we're heat treating it and figuring that whole thing out. And now we get three weeks of shelf life on it in the keg. And we're like the, one of the first companies at that time doing a latte in a keg, but not just a latte, a vegan latte and not just a vegan latte, a mushroom vegan latte mocha. You know what I'm saying? And, and so it was like such a while. We, we, it wasn't like we just took it one step further. We took it like five steps further. And we jumped through all those hoops and jumped over all these hurdles just to get into one cafe. And was, then it was, was it always called the Chagachino from that? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then it, it became so popular um, after that first day. Anyone try to buy it from you? Everyone try to buy the name or the rights or the concoction, the formula? I mean, we've had a lot of people wanting to invest and we've had a lot of like, we've had a lot of people come to us in terms of like wanting to do different projects with us with it. And, you know, I mean, just that, that it got so much exposure because you had everyone from like Gwyneth Paltrow to Kourtney Kardashian to Hillary after all these celebrities drinking at Alfred and they were taking photos of it. Like they, they were ready to take photos of their latte, but in a way that it was completely brand new because it's a, it's the first mushroom coffee they'd ever seen at a coffee shop. And the fact that it tasted good and like they, they were just, people were obsessed in the grand vision. We're like, let's, if Starbucks can create this drink called the Frappuccino and it's the most popular coffee selling drink on the planet by far. Why can't we do the healthy version of that and launch that at all these coffee shops? We don't need to open our own. There's a million coffee shops that exist. And, you know, the innovation at that time in coffee, I would say was like bulletproof. People were putting butter in their coffee, but not really in the cafe. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and MCT oil. Yeah. So, but not really so People much in the cafe. Yeah. 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 No, they still do. And bulletproof's a big company now, you know, so good for them for innovating. I'm, I'm all about that. You know, I, I look at the competitors like, almost like allies in that way, you know, if it, yeah, you're all fighting, you're all educating the market exactly. in different ways. As long as you're surfing the same wave, as long as you're running in the wolf pack, the competitors are helping spend those marketing dollars, helping educate people. So every brand, like you said, every brand is a little different. You know, we're, we're different because we really wanted to taste delicious. We want to taste like coffee ice cream. Whereas another brand is maybe about like just the benefits, just the not, benefits, yeah, not just so much it. the taste or another brand might be about, not about coffee, but about this, thing. you know, so there's always going to be a difference. I don't really look at the other brands as competitors. Did you ever think of like creating your own shop in, in some way where people can come in and kind of try all of your different beverages? So that way you obviously you have the hero product. You learn that doing the Melrose trading post, but it's also like you still have other products that maybe the market is more ready for. I don't know. And so I don't know if you ever thought about just doing like a shop or a pop-up or yeah, but, but in like a retail setting, I really thought about doing like a, a, a pop-up like next shop. to Alfred or something. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they have a lot of pop-ups. The Glossier was in there and all these cool places. Uh, they, there's pop-up spaces there all the time. And I've, I've thought about it. 
but the mission that I wanted to focus on, and, and this is the issue too with, with running this business, especially me, because my personality is to want to do all these things, all these different things and, and staying like staying laser focused in that tunnel, like that's working is, 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 is challenging for me because I honestly want to do all these things. I want to do pop-ups. I want to do all these other beverages. I want to, do, you know, but the first mission was get this in every major city in every third wave coffee shop, independent coffee shop and, and chains and get this on the menu in the same way that impossible. And we're not trying to take away anything off the menu. The same way that impossible burger went to the burger joints and offered them, whether it's fat burger or umami or burger King even now. Right. And, and I think it's them and beyond impossible, maybe, a I don't know, Burger King, which one they have, but you know, these plant-based burgers, it just gives people the option to have that on the meatless Monday or whatever versus saying we're taking away your meat. You know, it's just another option. So we wanted to do the same thing in coffee. We're like, let's give people the option. We're not going to take away their mochas or their frappuccinos or whatever. We're just going to give them a healthy option at the coffee shop. So that was really like the mission in the same way that the Frappuccino became it, well, let's be let's be this at, at be the mushroom coffee at every coffee. And how shop. many how many coffee shops are you at right now, or how many cities are you in? We're currently in a, in, in over fifteen hundred coffee shops, and we're wow. in almost every major city. I mean, we're in the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Vegas. We're in uh, L.A. in New York, Miami. But what has been the marketing, you know, like the strategy for you guys from a marketing perspective? Obviously, Alfred creates some good good posts. Great, you have celebrity endorsement in some way, but then just in terms of like. Is it, is it today less education than it used to be? Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Now you can like, focus on taste probably way more than you could before. Yeah. Now if, if we, if you walk around Los Angeles or New York and you ask somebody if they've had a Chagachino, yeah. most likely they have, or they know someone who has, yeah. so they've heard of the drink or they've heard of mushroom coffee. Mm -hmm. So the education now, it's just so different than it was when we were, I was literally knocking on, there's a coffee shop on, on sunset here called Blackwood. Yeah. Um, and I remember my barber was next door. I'm getting my hair cut and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go walk into Blackwood as in the first coffee shop, like literally yeah. like just next door and talk to them about this mushroom coffee thing. And I, I had created some like marketing materials that I wanted to test and kind of script that I wanted to test that could be replicated. So it was sort of like a trial and error thing. And I walk in, I talk to the barista and I'm so nervous, like I'm sweating and like, <laughs> you know, I don't know why nature does that to you. It's like you, you turn red, you sweat. I don't know. It's like, it's like. You know, yeah, what evolutionary benefit? How does that can help me had when I'm? That? Yeah, like how does that help me For in these listening, moments? People listening, Brandon is sweating red, <laughs> and, he's, and he's, so he's turning red. red. Yeah. For people watching, you, you know, this is red you know, like tomato. You start <laughs> pouring it. So actually, yeah. it's funny. The first time I met my, well, she was, you know, my girlfriend at the time, but my wife's parents now. That happened to me. It was like over Christmas, and I remember taking like a steam shower and then wearing like cashmere, a red cashmere <laughs> like sweater to a Chinese restaurant to meet them. Uh -huh. And I walk in, and it's so hot in there. They like turn up the heat and, and all those things together, and being a little nervous, I literally had to excuse myself because I was pouring in sweat like a fat yeah. Elvis who just yeah. ate like too many peanut Sometimes butter sandwiches. Sometimes you just need that five minute break. Oh, man. Uh, so yeah, so I excuse myself. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> wait, wait, so you go into so you go to the Blackwood. coffee shop. And oh yeah, you're, you're and, and, and and same things happening. I'm sweating. I'm like turning red, and I just forced myself. That it's so crazy. That was the hardest part of this entire journey for me. Everyone has like what's the hardest thing for like them? The sales part. Yeah, just like getting the the guts to walk into that cafe and like pitch them this thing. I thought they were gonna laugh at me, and there's a line of people there, and they're like busy making drinks. The baristas, and here I'm walking in, like knocking on the door or like some, you know, door to door magazine salesman. And, you know, I'm just expecting them to treat me like, like, you know, terribly. And, and I don't know, I'm just scared to do it, you know? And so I walk up, I talk to the barista and I show them this, this the presentation in the box, marketing materials. Have you heard of mushroom coffee? I think I actually ordered a drink first because I was so nervous. I'm like, can I get a lot? Just to get out of the just, way. Just to, just like, to start I'm a paying talking. Customer, like, yeah, I'm a paying customer. Yeah, now yeah. I'm going to annoy uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's how it went down. And then he was like, oh, that's so cool. And he was so into it. And then he started taking photos of it. He's like, I'm going to send this to our owner right now, Keith. And and then somebody walked in who was from the farmer's market. I was like our big fan. He's like, oh, Chagachino's here. And I'm like, oh, this is like a sign. Like I'm wow. getting so much love right now. That's so like, cool. The barista's taking photos of it. The, this guy, our big super fan from our farmer's market, Andrew's here, and he's screaming Chagachino. And so that's how it all went down. And then it took me like a while to track down Keith 
And, um, you know, I had to have Shane like, like, like go reach out. I had to get yeah. like, I had to get a haircut when I didn't need one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you should have taken from that is every pitch that you had lined up after that, have someone waiting outside and be like, all right, in two minutes, I want you to walk in <laughs> yeah. and just be like, Oh, Chaga Chino's here. <laughs> totally. That, that like can't buy me love. Have. Right. Yeah. It's like that, that works, you know, that, that fake it till you make it, that cheerleading team. So, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we did in a way, like not, not to that extent, but like then after refining the pitch and getting Blackwood on board, then it quickly became one of their most popular drinks. We then said, you know what, I'm going to start hiring my first salesperson and that was a scary moment you know and I, I had personally signed up like five or ten local shops at that point and it's crushing it at all of them so then I I hire and I hired two of them in LA to get started and they just crushed it they just got it into almost every coffee shop in LA and and the baristas and the decision makers were really receptive to it so we're like all right if this is working so well in LA let's get this out in New York and we just slowly right. grew it like right. that you know, that's basically how it went down. Did you ever have any problems fulfilling the orders as you scaled, though? Oh, well, one thing I didn't mention was, so Alfred at one point, this this is before we started scaling. They, they then say to us, look, we need our kegs for this new kombucha drink. So, sorry, no more kegs. And, you know, that was after I had the you know, figured out, got, got, got into the rhythm yeah, and the groove yeah, yeah. and that, that the, the dude in, in Camarillo, I'm driving to Camarillo twice a week and I'm like all this stuff, getting the refrigerated truck over there, renting one. And I kind of figured out this like ridiculous system of doing that myself. And it was actually like really a blessing because I always wanted to do it in a powder format because that's, that's how we were making it at, at the co-packer anyways, you know, we were just mixing the powder into it. So, and plus, I thought, I thought, you know, it tastes so much better when you're using freshly ground coffee beans from the cafe and, you know, whatever milk they're making, nut milk or whatever it may be, or oat milk. It just tasted better, like fresh like that. And then they just drop and mix it into the latte. So Alfred, after like two months, they come back to us saying, you know, our customers are keep asking for Chaga Chino yeah. and it's not here. Like we need it back. And we're, but we're not going to do it in a keg. We want to do it in as you, we just added to our lattes, like you guys like a mocha or whatever vanilla. So we said, cool. That's yes. That's exactly how we wanted to do this the whole time. I've been running around renting kegs and, and make, Oh my God, thank God I get to stop going to Camarillo twice a week, driving a refrigerated truck. So then we started doing it that way. And once we did it that way, I knew I could scale it. And that's when we started going out to all the cafes and yeah. doing it that and then way. Then you went e-commerce too. So people can go directly to you. Correct. Over COVID people really wanted this thing. They were, they were asked because a lot of these cafes had shut yeah. down or they were just doing window service. Right. And so we quickly got this thing out during COVID. And there are some articles that saying like Chaga is the number one thing to like uh, help your immune system, like to prevent and to help you when you get COVID. Anything like that during COVID? It was wild. ran to it. Yeah. So we, so we had it on our website. Yeah. And these, these boxes are like both register boxes. So we made a register box for the cafe and something that people could have at home. Like you just know, put in their cabinet. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So instead of adding the sugar to your coffee, the thing about it like that, you just add a packet of that. Is this one, one packet? Yeah. So we, like a half? Yeah, like a half. Honestly, it's more like 20 servings. We, we oh, were wow. super generous in the way that we did these packets because we were in such a rush to get it done for people at home that we just used the portions we were giving to the coffee shops. And one thing we realized was, you know, the coffee size, coffee shop size cups, especially for iced coffee, and this can be drink, drink hot too, but yeah. mainly people order it as an iced oat milk type of deal. And those were like 16 ounce cups and people at home are using like eight ounce mugs. So we're giving people kind of the coffee shop size in per packet. So we, I, I always tell people as much as I can and to go with half a packet and you could stretch yeah. that to 20 drinks too. I was going to ask, so like I know with say vitamin C mm -hmm. beyond a certain percentage, your body's just going to end up peeing it out Correct. and you're not going to get any benefit whatsoever. Is that something similar with, with Chaga where beyond a certain point, it stops having an effect? Not that I'm aware of, but you know, I know, I know that there's a daily effective dose, which is anywhere from 500 milligrams to 1.5 grams. And there's, um, and that's what we're giving people. We're giving them their daily effective dose. But I do know that there's studies where people that like, with like, you know, and again, we don't make these disease claims, but like people with cancer who want to use this in addition to whatever their chemotherapy and, and stuff like that, they'll use up to like 50 times the amount 
like 50 grams of this stuff. And there's a lot of research on that. So you can really scale it up. Unlike vitamin C, like your body can really um, accept this. And I think one of the reasons for that is our DNA is a lot more similar to the fungi kingdom than the plant kingdom. So like a lot of these supplements um, that we take, uh, well, actually like there, there are some that are made from the fungi kingdom, like penicillin was made from a fungus, but during evolution, what happened was the, the, you know, I think it was like single cell or prokaryote, eukaryote. And then, you know, it, it, then the kingdoms branched off as evolution happened. And then the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom and the fungi kingdom were all one. And then a billion years later, the plant kingdom branched off and you saw the animal kingdom, which is us and the fungi kingdom together for a, another like 500 to a billion years. So our DNA resembles the fungi kingdom and is a closer match to that than the plant kingdom. And that doesn't mean like kale and plants aren't bad for you. It just means that like the bioavailability and the nutrient transfer from this to us is a lot higher in the from the fungi kingdom. And I don't know if that's the exact reason why you can have more chaga than the others, but it's just a fun fact that I had learned uh, when, when going through this exercise of learning about the f mushrooms and the fungi kingdom. And I've had it, I've had it in my latte and it literally, to your point, what well, you said before, like instead of using sugar, like this sweetens it up just the right amount. And I usually don't put any, any sort of sweetener in my drinks. Usually it's just like almond milk, good milk specifically, and the espresso. And this makes it a little more delicious. Yeah. And we've, and, and we've done collabs with good milk. We love that company. Yeah. They got a great product. So it's super drop and mix, barista friendly, but also friendly for people at home, just like tearing a packet of sugar totally. to add this to it. What's next? What's on the horizon for Renewed? So we're working on a matcha chaga mix because oh, nice. our audience really likes matcha okay. too. So you're partnering with someone on the matcha side or? We're, we're, we're talking to some suppliers right now and, and I, we already got the, the formulation done. It's just a matter of like, who are we going to use as a supplier? How, are we going to call out their brand or are we just going to, you know, use a really high quality ceremonial grade matcha? Um, from Japan and, and just, you know, pre-mix it for people. There's a lot of people making it that way. They're adding this to their matcha and a lot of people just add it to a plant-based milk for like this kind of cinnamon toast crunch mocha milk kind of taste. So that's what we're working on right now. And then I got a couple other things we're working on in terms of beverage. I got a project that I'm working on. That's like totally separate from this, this powder game, which is, I mean, look, we would love to bottle it at some point. And yeah. The CPG seems right up your alley. Be like the bottled seems, mushroom seems coffee. Like you're ready to drink category is, why not? I would love to do that, especially with the awareness that we've built, you yeah. know? So that's always on the table. And then, you know, well, it's, it, it's building the team has been kind of like a hard part, especially with the great reshuffle that goes, that's been going on. Getting the team strong is, is key before we sure. sort of expand and do other things. But we are, I am actively working on another, other projects. Like we're working on a clean cola right now where it's very similar. We go ingredient by ingredient from a Coke or a Pepsi. And we take the bad ingredient out and put the good one in. So if they're using like a lemon natural flavor, we'll use lemon peel. If they're using an orange natural flavor, we'll use orange peel. If they're using, you know, caramel color, we're going to use like a, 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 that, that color from a vegetable or malt, which they use in like a beer or something like that. Um, taking out the phosphoric acid, the aspartame, the high fructose corn syrup, all, all the bad stuff. Cause it's such a delicious drink, but it's like to have shame every time you drink it, you know what I'm saying? And I haven't come across a brand that like has nailed that close your eyes, taste it. And you don't know what's what I've had. I've had some like, you know, apple cider vinegar, cola flavors, kombucha flavors, or like a prebiotic drink. Like, like Olipop has, has a decent one, but it's not a, a complete cola replace Coke replacement for me. It's just tastes like, it tastes like maybe a little bit, this could be a little cola flavored for this kind of a beverage. So I'm trying to literally just reinvent that for, from again, this is selfish because I drink Coke Zero sometimes and I love it. And every time I do it, I have to feel bad. I'm drinking aspartame. I know that causes cancer. So I know I have to like drink so little of that. And if I drink the, the other can, I know it has all these terrible ingredients in it. Where are you guys at from like a fundraising? Are you just self-funding it right now? Or are you raising capital? Just self-funding and, you know, I've really you know, been flirting with raising capital lately, especially as I get into the bigger things like that at that point. And you know how it is running a business like this. It's like, a, I'm sure you've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. It's like you're with the, between the inventory and the ordering that you have to do before you sell it. And then the warehousing and everything, it's like, you're almost like a bank in, in, in that part of things. And, um, it's very capital intensive to, to run a, a, a CPG company. So, yeah, I mean, 
at some point we're going to have to raise, you know, and it's just, it's just the timing of when, you know, I wanted to build it, show the proof of concept, especially with such a wild thing like mushroom coffee. You know, we literally started out saying WTF is a mushroom coffee. We wanted to come out like Eminem with hi, my name is, you know, just like loud and aggressive. And it's funny, we did this coffee fest and, and we had this big sign that says WTF, you know, what the fuck is a Chagachino with a question mark. And people would walk by and they would look at this and they would see Chagachino. They'd be like, what the fuck is a Chagachino? I'm like, yeah, exactly. Read the sign. And like, yeah. you know, and they're like, right. yeah. So, and, and it's just so great to now see people like hear of this thing and know what it is. It just makes me smile. I was in New York the other day. Hugh Jackman has a cafe out there called Laughing Man that they serve it in. There's a lot of great coffee shops in New York have it. And um, I'm just like pulling out my phone on Google and I go, where can I find a Chagachino? And Google has like five or six. We have this little oh, kid wow. on our website. Yeah. But Google right there had tags. six cafes tagged because somebody must have mentioned it in their totally. Yelp review or yeah. whatever. And so I click on it and I, and I go within like a quarter mile radius to like six coffee shops in New York that have this drink. Th those are the kind of things that make me feel good, especially when you deal with all these challenges, especially when you drive in a refrigerated truck from Camarillo twice a week and if you've sweat and, and turned into a tomato in, in a <laughs> coffee shop with lots of like good looking people around you and you've like gone through all of this 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 you're like just beginning though. Yeah. you're just starting in that and moment you can zoom out and see also so what good you've built yeah and, and on the other side of the country so far and like it's just totally it's yeah. just those are nice moments totally and those small wins in business is, is what you need to keep going you That's know it's it. like yeah. we got to think long term we got to have that focus but it's all about celebrating at times the small wins you know that's equivalent to like you know where they say stop and smell the roses or whatever well listen tell everyone where they can find you and ultimately how much they can buy the product for obviously their local coffee yeah. shops farm cup right here has it yeah right yeah. west hollywood yeah so they can go to drinkrenewed.com and we spell nude like naked so it's d-r-i-n-k-r-e-n-u-d-e.com and you can find the product there. We're also working on a 30 serving eco-friendly canister that's going to be launching oh, nice. in about a month. Nice. And then people will be able to just kind of like scoop that into their coffee with a measured scooper. Like the athletic greens. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or like smart. a protein kind of powder smart. type deal. Smart. Our audience, that's the number one thing they've been asking for. So we'll have that launched in that's about a smart. month from now. And we'll have like little refill bags that they can use for that as well. That'll be discounted. And yeah, for your audience right now, if they want to try the Chagachino, where you wanted to run a promo code STS15 gets you 15% off on it. STS15. Uh, add it to your coffee. Love upgrade it. your coffees. Supercharge well, your coffees. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for coming on the Brandon. podcast, brother. Yeah, this was it. awesome. Great talking to you guys. That was our conversation with Brandon of Renewed. If you enjoyed this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with a friend. Recently, we started putting out a bi-monthly newsletter. We highlight certain moments in our podcast episodes that you may have missed, along with little tidbits of behind-the-scenes information about the recording. You can find the newsletter at our website, startupstorefront.com. Another way you can support the show is to leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. We are found at Startup Storefront on every social media platform, with the exception of Twitter, where you can find us at STS Podcast LA. The team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Lexi Jameson, Owen Capellini, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is by Double Touch. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.